So Romans 12, he, he opens up, I urge you therefore. You have the therefore connection. Um, you have the admonishment. Uh, I admonish, I call upon. Um, so already with the first three words, you have a connection with uh, Paul here to the audience, with Paul in everything he has said up to this point in Romans. In Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, uh, we're not going to go there, but that's a portion uh, at the beginning where we, uh, Paul talks about baptism and the identification in our death with his life, with his death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, the picture of what baptism is, and we've died to sin, and he moves on from that in chapter 6, 7, and 8, where death is, is a part of that, and there's a, there's a death in us um, uh, to our old selves, our old nature, to, to sin, and it's everything because he's alive. And we catch that, and we could, Paul could have, and of course, Paul is the writer of this, not me, Paul could have gone from chapter 8 straight to here. But he didn't, and he therefore went from chapter 8 to chapter 9, 10, and 11, in which he deals with Israel. And Israel, uh, God's chosen people, missed the boat. That is to say, God chose them, God presented himself to them, God walked with them, God gave them the law, God gave them the temple, God gave them a, a, a land, he made them a people, and if you look at uh, Jewish history, they continually shined God on. And eventually, if you read through the uh, prophets, you can read the, the book of Ezekiel, and, and uh, the priests are at the temple, but they're not in the temple. They're at the temple door facing east, worshiping the sun as it comes up. And inside the temple, they have put uh, base reliefs, uh, various drawings, pictures of, uh, of uh, creatures, uh, crawly things, things of this, earl, uh, of this world to worship. And uh, God finally said, oh, enough is enough, and he sent them into captivity. And, and uh, then in, in also in, in these chapters, he uh, he'd said that he had warned the people that he's going to take a people who is not his people and make them his people, and that's us. Uh, God has uh, allowed the Gentiles to enter into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And we are his family. We are his bride. We are the bride of Christ. And you read in uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of God's mercy extended to us Whereas it was uh, withdrawn from his people, he had shown mercy to his people over the centuries and millennia, and yet they continually to, uh, to continued to uh, set God aside. And when Jesus shows up, uh, John tells us he came into his own people, or uh, to his to his own creation, and those who were his own people rejected him, and uh, so his people. Uh, were the ones that uh, denied him and beat him and crucified him and buried him. And uh, then he rose from the dead victorious and allowed us to enter into relationship as we have then looked at his plan of redemption, the cross, and said, wow, thank you, God of creation, that you have provided a way for me to have a relationship with you. God became man and dwelt among us. And it's, it's like crazy stuff, fantastically wonderful, unbelievable, neat, cool. And as you uh, finish up uh, in chapter 11 of, Ro of Romans, uh, starting in verse 25, again, due to lack of time, we're not going to go there, but he just talks about, listen, you Gentiles, Who've, been, who've entered into relationship, you've been grafted in, you've been adopted, um, you are the called out ones, you're the church. Don't become arrogant. God's mercy, he's not going to leave his people dangling. Uh, 
the Jews don't just go out there and, you know, they're off in left field somewhere forever and ever and ever and ever. And very clearly, in verse 25 through the end of chapter 11, God says, oh no, oh no. My mercy is extended to them, and they will once again be my people face-to-face, -face, two thumbs up, relational, and all of that. So that is obviously in five minutes a quick synopsis of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, six chapters. Can you believe I did that? <laughs> <sighs> all right. So, yeah, it's a miracle. I know. <laughs> So in chapter 12, Paul is now taking all of the doctrinal material from chapter 1 through chapter 11 and all of the uh, righteousness, justification, all the legal, all the theological, all the soteriological uh, salvation discussion there uh, by faith and we move to chapter 12, verse 1, and he's now going to say, and this is how it works. And so from chapter 12 through the end of Romans, we find that Paul is going to be um, unpacking all of these spiritual things, uh, these relational things with God into relational things, practical relational things with God, but also practical relational things with one another. And so he begins, therefore, with an admonition. I admonish you. I urge you. I call upon you. And, uh, you know, that's what Paul does. And you, you've, we've seen it all through his writings. I urge you. I admonish you. I call upon you. And you could just see Paul, however he would do it. I don't know how Paul would, would stand to do that. But... He says, therefore, based upon all these things I've, I've said. Now, there's, there's, a, um, there's a point in here that uh, it's an infinitive. There's, there's going to be an action that he's calling for. And it's kind of like everything, you have, you have your stuff in the middle and then everything builds out from that. And it's the infinitive, uh, which is to present, to present to God, to dedicate, to uh, consecrate, to devote. So when you see in here where he says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present, this to present is what we're talking about. And this to present... Um, I believe that in the English, I mean, it means to present, but sometimes it, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever received an award, you know, somebody comes up and pins a little pin on you, your 10-year pin or your 20-year pin or uh, whatever, um, and it's kind of like you got presented. Well, this isn't really that. This to present is is kind of like this. Um, it's more or less in that mode rather than, oh, here's a pin, here's your 10 year pin, congratulations. No. It's here is what I'm presenting to you, oh God. And therefore, you could, you could write in here to dedicate. Which, which twists it a little bit for us. The uh, New International says to offer, and that, I believe, falls more into line rather than to present, because to present uh, means that you, uh, you, know, you have perfect attendance for Sunday school. So here's your Sunday school pin. Uh, we, he call, he's calling us to present, to offer, to dedicate, to consecrate, to set aside something unto God. So what is he going to be saying here? There's a verse 1, and then there's other things in verse 2. So in verse 1, he's urging us based upon what he has said. And he says, through the, through the mercies of God. And I, in the past, have utilized just uh, 
verses 25 through the end of chapter 11 in this. And yet I went back, and I went back to uh, chapter 6 and 7 and 8, and then 9, 10, 11, and I saw how the mercies of God have been extended all the way through in our salvation and to the Jews. And then the Jews said no, and so his mercies were extended to us. And then at, at the end of 11, it culminates with the fact that his mercies are going to be re-extended to the Jews. And, and so it, it's appropriate here that the mercies, plural, of God are in our, in our brains. By God's mercies, which we saw extended in salvation and righteousness and justice, uh, by faith to us, to the Jews, by those mercies, I want you, as Peter would say, gird up the loins of your mind. I want you to look at this soberly. I want you to look at this so that you're comprehending where you live. And so he says to offer to dedicate, to consecrate, to present, what? Your bodies, your bodies as a living sacrifice. First of all, let's deal with the word sacrifice, living sacrifice. This isn't just an offering. An offering would be a different word. This is actually the blood sacrifice. So, um, we're not looking at, um, uh, I don't even know what to say. Uh, you know, the offering plate is passed around. And, and so we give an offering. It could be $10, it could be $1,000. It doesn't matter because it's simply an offering. But when we come to this word, the the sacrifice, a living sacrifice, we're talking about that which you, you take and you place upon the altar, and of course, usually they slit the, the throat, so that the blood was shed on the altar, and that's what was called for, it was a blood sacrifice. It was a 100% costly payment. And what's unusual about this especially as we connect this with chapters 6, 7, and 8, if you go back and read that, death is in there a lot. Death to sin. Death in sin. Uh, Christ's death. Our uh, reflection of that in baptism, where we die to self and become alive to God, and all those things. Death is back there. P uh, Paul draws attention here to the fact that this blood sacrifice is us, but we are presented as a living sacrifice. And I, if you've been with me long enough, you've heard me say that the problem with the living sacrifice is that it keeps call, crawling down off the altar. But that misses the point, because that almost makes it look as an offering, but it's not. This dedication, this presentation, this consecration, uh, this uh, offering up to God is a blood sacrifice. And yet because we're living, and this is the point, we get to do it again and 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 again. Day by day, uh, hour by hour, moment by moment. And so Paul here digs deep, and he looks everybody in the eye and he says, this is, this is life and death. This is. All that we've talked about isn't ethereal. I'm saved and I know it, so I clap my hands and now I go out and live like I want to live. Doesn't work that way. Never was intended to live that way. And Paul is saying it doesn't work that way. And as I've considered this, and now we're moving on uh, because we've covered living sacrifice, we're going to our bodies. And one of the questions I asked as I was going through this is, why our bodies? Why not our wealth? Why not our, our goods? Why not our time? And I'm, I'm not going to tell you, stand here to tell you this morning, that I understand everything about the implications of this but at least I've started to make inroads and I've, I've got the rest of my 
life to work through it. But our, bo our bodies is what God has given us to glorify him. Inside this house, the only house I have, I mean, really, because I can sleep in my car, I can eat at a restaurant, I can, you know, I can do things all over. The, I don't need my house at home. But this is the only house I've got. And in this, God has given me intellect, and he's given me will, and he's given me emotions. And from this, this body, I get to jump into living for Jesus. It's this body that houses the response that we sang here, it is well with my soul. We sang that, I think, did I share that with you? I, we sang that at the memorial service we had two weeks ago uh, because it was a favorite of the uh, deceased. And we used to sing that every time we showed up, uh, Kathy and I showed up. Uh, this body houses the response that exudes as we sing, it is well with my soul. It's in here, and I get to share that with you. It is well with my soul, and you get to, your body responds with the emotions that are inside and your intellect, and why our bodies? I believe it's because it's the most costly thing we possess. Because everything goes out from this body. My thoughts about you, your thoughts about me, they're, they're housed in here and they somehow peep out through these peepers or extend out through these hands or uh, the tears weep with you and you weep and the smile smiles when you smile. So when it says, when Paul says, by God's mercies, which we have seen and experienced and we comprehend as we understand the whole death life thing with God, that Paul says, dedicate, consecrate, present, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies holy. And as I've comprehended this, um, um, well, comprehended, again, uh, worked on it, comprehension. Uh, it's like I've spent so much time in this, and yet I feel like I'm, a, I'm in the first grade, and I'm on my way to my double doctorate, and I'm still in the first grade. Um, dedicating my body as a living sacrifice, holy. What does my holy body mean? Well, um, with this, it'd be real, real easy, not interesting, easy to enter into discussions on what we allow to enter into our bodies to poison us. And I'm not here to talk about your diet or your smoking or your drinking or your recreational activities. And yet, how easy is it to draw these conclusions or these lines? I don't need to say it. Paul already has. And if those things are all holy to God, and I, I am careful with that, because obviously if we all indulged in two dozen donuts a day, probably we'd all have a problem. But if all of, all of us indulge in a donut a day, probably that's not, a, not an issue. So I'm not here to rain on your parade or be your Holy Spirit and convict you, but I am here to draw attention to the fact that God is saying, if you present your body a living sacrifice, don't forget that you have been called to be holy. Remember what 1 Peter said in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16? You be holy, because I'm holy. So our bodies are also supposed to be holy in this presentation. And there's one final, final thing. And it, this word is well-pleasing or pleasing, uh, or some translations acceptable. Um, when we present ourselves to God well-pleasing, we don't want to forget what I have mentioned several times about the end 
when Jesus stands before us, or we stand before him, rather, and he says, enter thou into my joy, which has been prepared for you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That involves our bodies. <laughs> and it's a, it should serve at the minimum as a speed bump for us, if not a stop sign in many of the things we do. It should serve, this concept should at least serve as a speed bump. And it served as a speed bump for me, um, as I've been contemplating. And I, I think that this passage, once again for me, as I, I've memorized it, but I'm, I've, I've only preached on it once that I can remember in my many years of ministry, but it's probably the first time I've really spent time thinking about how my, my body is a living sacrifice, and it's uh, presented, dedicated to God. My body is holy, and it's presented to God. And my body, as in the presentation, has to be well-pleasing, which means that the activities of my body have to be well-pleasing. The activities of my mind, which is housed in my body, uh, my attitudes, which are uh, part of my housed in this body, it's all supposed to be presented to God is that which is well-pleasing. If you want to use the word acceptable, I believe that that works just fine. If we had more time, we'd spend more time, but I've got to move on. This, it says, is your reasonable service. And uh, as a kid, I said, why is this translation different than the, you know, I got the New American Standard. It says your spiritual service of worship, and I'm going, reasonable service? Spiritual service of worship. It's like, uh, and what's funny is they're the same. You're going to say, don't look the same. So I need to explain. First of all, reasonable. That's the word. It's from the, the root foundation of logical. Reasonable, pertaining to reason, rational, uh, rational spiritual, um, pertaining to the mind and the soul. So that which exudes from in here and extends out in my, in my activities involving this body is a reasonable something, a reasonable activity. A logical activity, if you want to go there. Um, and, it's, and it's a spiritual thing. Yes, it involves the mind, but it's a spiritual connection. Reasonable. Uh, Kathy and I listen to a few things on the way up, and sometimes we just shake, sit, sorry, sit there and shake our heads. There we go, um, and say that's not even reasonable. Why isn't this reasonable? Well, it's because if if we don't involve our bodies in the activities uh, in a in a uh, presentation to God, which is a uh, holy thing, then that which is reasonable is going to be set aside. And that's why you're going to hear about things that are totally illogical if you listen to the news, if you can stomach it. You know, somebody says something and you hear an, an interpretation of what they said and you go, how in the world did they get that from that? No. Oh, what he meant was yes. It's like, I don't even get it. Well, there's no reason. There's no logic. And part of that is because it's disconnected from the rest of this. So when we do the first part to present, to offer, to uh, dedicate, consecrate our bodies in, in those ways, it, uh, Paul concludes and says it's your reasonable, and then the last word is service. And this is, um, this, uh, this is not the service that you read about that Stephen did in Acts, that the uh, uh, disciples did, the apostles did in Acts, where they served. They served the tables. Uh, some of you are going to be serving down here. Some of you already have in the making of the food and so on. Uh, that's not this service. This is the service that cuts down deeper into what is connected with worship. And when it says service of worship... Remember, worship, worship 
Some churches, uh, some groups, some church cultures only believe that worship is singing songs and raising your hands. And it's like, ah, uh, let's connect the rest of the dots here, folks. And part of that is this. It's a service of worship from the heart. This is, I do this, a simple activity, a simple action out of worship for God. I do it because I love him. And that's where we need to go. So the heart of the servant is going to connect the dots of their worship with God with the activities of their hands, their eyes, their feet, their heart, their minds. So we have verse 1, which is a call to present to offer, to dedicate, to consecrate our bodies in these ways, in a holy way, in a uh, well-pleasing way to God, as a living sacrifice. But he doesn't stop there. He con continues in verse 2, and he says, and this is, there's, there's a problem in the English. Now, the words are translated correctly, but we, but they're, when we say conform and transform, we have form as a, a, a foundation, and uh, conform means with uh, connecting with it, and transform means th through the form. And the problem is that in the Greek, it's, it's those words in the English, but we, we lose something. So this is what it says. Um, and not fashioned to the age, to this age, but metamorphized in the renewing of the mind. And that, I hope, expands those concepts a little bit for you. Confirmation is fashioning. And it's not just to this world, but it's to this age. And it doesn't take long as you listen to um, reason or lack thereof of this age who has been uh, reaching into the minds and hearts of the American people or the world people. Uh, might makes right. Uh, so many things that people could say or do say, and yet Paul very simply says, do not be fashioned according to this age. And then he moves on. Rather than fashioning according to this age, rather be metamorphized. And that's the word. I'm not grasping here. That's the word. Metamorphized uh, in the renewing of the mind. And we have to be careful because there is a battle for our minds. And you're confronted with that battle every day. And um, I don't really have time, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I don't usually go on Facebook, but Kathy was in shopping, and so I'm bored. So I <clears throat> checked Facebook, and a preacher had preached, and I'm not even going to mention the topic, but he, he preached on this, or he responded to it, and then I, I didn't even listen to the video, because I wanted to look at the comments, and I was aghast at the comments. Here was a spiritual man giving a spiritual response, and the antagonism, the vitriol, the uh, arrogance in the responses. And, I mean, Kathy got to hear me, you know, talk when she got into the car. Like, I couldn't believe this! And I tried to express it, and I, I without going through and sharing more specifically, which I'm not going to do, uh, it was unbelievable. Here this guy made spiritual comments from the Word, uh, in a sense, defending God, and the response was, Ugh! Be metamorphosed, morph, metamorphosed uh, in the brain. Uh, renewing of your mind. Had more time, we'd stop more, but we can't. So that you, this is what you do, you test out. You test out with the intention 
of proving. That's what it is. It's the same thing as taking a, a coin and, hey, that's gold, or whatever it is. Uh, you test out the will of God and what it is. And these are, this is what the will of God is. First of all, it is good. And that's the same word that Peter has used again and again. Paul uses it, not the same word um, in other places, but here it is. Good, profitable, generous, beneficent, upright, and virtuous. The will of God is that. The will of God is well-pleasing. And the will of God is complete from end to end. So the first part dealt really with our bodies. The second part really deals with our minds. That's kind of a generality, but that will give you something to chew on. We don't want to be fashioned according to this age. Rather, we want to be changed, transformed by the renewing of our minds. And where do we get that? We get that in the Word of God. God gives us His will in His Word, and it is beneficent to us. It is good. It has value. It has virtue. We hang on to the will of God. Oh, we, we may not know what shoes to wear today, uh, and we say, dear God, please, shall I wear white or black shoes? And it's like, oh, please. Let's go with, Lord, what shall my response be to my neighbor? What shall my response be to this? How can I please you in this? God's will is good. God's will is well-pleasing. You, you can never obey God and give him a frown. You can't. It's impossible. Please... Obey God, and it will be well-pleasing to him. Maybe hard for you, but well-pleasing to him. And God's will is complete from end to end. If he asks you to do something, there's a purpose. And it is perfect. It is complete. Uh, this is what I want you to do, Wayne. Oh, Lord, that's so hard. It's sacrificial. He says, yep, but I got it under control. So, okay, here we go. So here we have Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, the Christian service. There's so much in here. We could have stopped and spent time with our bodies. We could have stopped and spent time with our renewing of our mind, uh, with the conforming to the world, with the transformation of the mind, and so on and so forth. Uh, you got what you got. It's the Christian service, and it's a reasonable service of worship. And it involves all of me, from here to here. And then because of that, what comes out here and here and here. And that's all he's called us to. Pretty simple, huh? <laughs> Father, we, uh, we sometimes wonder uh, what you want in our lives. And yet sometimes it's so much just straight on ahead of us um, that if we uh, tried to miss it, we couldn't. Lord, these things in your word about what we are, who we are, um, what's important to an individual in here, Lord, that depends on how you're convicting them. But the presentation of myself, the offering of myself, my body, and all that that entails from the inside out, um, that's your work in me. And it may not always be easy, but it's always good, it's always well-pleasing, and it's always complete if I'll let you do it. So Lord, we've got a ways to go, but that's why we have your word and your spirit. Continue to work in us, move us, draw us, and uh, may in the end result of that, we give you glory. Because that's what you ask for, and that's what our heart's desire should be. So Lord, as always, take us from where we are and lead us to where we need to be, for Christ's sake. Amen.